Good morning, guys. Hello. Let me know if you can hear me, if you want to say hello. Good morning, teacher. Hello, Caro. Hello, Vanessa. Hello, Paulina, Eileen, Ale. Good morning. Today, guys, what I'd like to do when we get get uh, get right into it today, I want to again leave you as much time as possible today to really dig in and get into the uh, sonnet. On Tuesday, we introduced the sonnet and talked about key points or key characteristics of writing a sonnet. So, just as a quick review, what were some of the takeaways? Some of the main things that we talked about on Tuesday, things that we have to consider when we're writing our own sonnet. What do you think? You guys can either unmute your mic or uh, post something in the chat. What do you think? What are some things we need to consider? What do you think? If you check, you can check your notes if you were taking notes. Uh, what do you recall? What are things that we need to to think about? In fact, we talked about three key points, three th key elements to a sonnet. Do you remember what those were? Uh, the iambic pentameter. All right. So iambic pentameter. Yeah. All right. Good. And what is iambic pentameter? What's another way? to to discuss that or what to explain that it's like the number of syllables that each line should have all right and anyone else can anyone else add to that explanation iambic pentameter What's I am? What's an I am? And what's a what's pentameter? What do you think? What's it refer to specifically in terms of a sonnet? What do you think? It has to do with the uh, stress, right? So what's another way of of explaining iambic pentameter? What's what's that mean in terms of stress? Iambic means two syllables is weak and strong or non stress or and then uh, an stress word. All right. And then pentameter. So if an I am is two syllables, one is unstressed and the second is stressed, da dun, da dun. That's an I am. And pentameter refers to what? The. Uh, could, sorry, could you repeat that? I think you were cutting out a little bit. Yes, to the ten syllables. Syllables. Right, that's it. So pentameter simply means five iams, right? So if I am, if an one I am has two syllables, then what this means is when you're writing a sonnet, each line should follow iambic pentameter. Each line should follow, it should have 10 syllables. Weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong. Da-da, 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 da-da. 
All right, so iambic pentameter. This is a very important aspect of a sonnet, probably the most challenging uh, aspect of writing a, a, a sonnet. All right, so that's one aspect. So iambic pentameter. What else? What other characteristic or feature do we need to think about when we're developing our own sonnet? The rhyme. The rhyme. And so we're, since we're going to be following what's called a Shakespearean sonnet, what's going to be our rhyming scheme? The first and the third, the second and the fourth, and so on. And so on, right? So usually if maybe a, using letters will will uh, simplify. So we have A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. All right, so we're going to have 14 lines of the sonnet and we'll follow this rhyming scheme. This rhyming scheme refers to the last word of each line. They need to rhyme. We talked about some strategies and, and tips. Uh, use whatever works for you. I suggested finding a, a good poem that you could base the sounds on. That is, you could use, just take the last words and then create word lists that rhyme with those words. Um, but, you know, do whatever works for you. But I think using different word associate, not word associations, but word uh, lists that rhyme with each other and just looking at that might help you get some ideas about putting certain words or combining certain words together uh, that in a way that makes sense, depending on, uh, you know, the object of your of your sonnet. OK, so the rhyming scheme. So we have iambic pentameter. We have the rhyming scheme. What's the third main component of our sonnet? The What's the third aspect that we need to think about beyond iambic pentameter and the rhyming scheme? The content. All right, the content and structure. So what do we mean by content and structure? What do we need to, how do we, what do we need to think about when we think about content and structure? What do you think? Why do we write a sonnet typically? Why? To show do, appreciation to someone. That's right. To praise someone, to acknowledge someone, to show your appreciation to someone or something, right? I'm going to say someone, but it could be something. It could be a, a favorite pet. Uh, it could be some aspect of nature if you have an, you want to show your appreciation to the trees or the grass, right? So whatever you feel strongly about that you want to show your appreciation, right, then this is a good thing to do. And especially when you're thinking about a human being, had, developing th such a poem would be a good opportunity for you actually to read the poem to that person, uh, to show to take it to the next level, to show that person uh, your your level of appreciation for that person, that you are willing to spend all this time really cranking out this really difficult poem to show how much you appreciate or praise this person. All right, so the first thing when we think about content structure, well, what's the purpose? Well, we're praising something or someone or some object. Now, there's some other a couple other things here that we need to think about when we think about structure. And one of the main things that we need to remember is line nine. And what do we need to do in line nine, the, the uh, third quatrain? Uh, 
I don't remember the exact word, but it was like changing the perspective a little bit. That's right. And you can use words like volta or the turn or the twist, right? Those are three words that, that come to mind for me when I think about some sort of turn in the, in, in the poem. All right. And one of the best ways, one of the best connectors or words to use to introduce the volta or the turn or the twist is the connector, but some sort of contrasting or even however, any type of contrasting connector. And why contrasting? Well, because we're actually, this is what we're doing in a turn or twist. So if you're praising this person, saying all these th great things about this person or this thing, the twist is going to offer some, some other something that's not maybe praiseworthy. Okay, maybe this person has flaws. Maybe the, the thing that you're praising has a downside. So you want to introduce in some figurative and clear and, and interesting way some sort of turn. And then in the couplet, in the couplet, the last two lines of your poem, your couplet, then you, this is your chance to either return back to praising the person, or maybe you want to end in some interesting way, right? There's, there's a lot of different ways that you want to conclude your poem, but the couplet is designed to uh, summarize or complete or to to comp or to summarize and, and conclude your your um, your sonnet, your ideas. Don't think of it necessarily as a story. It's more about showing appreciation. Now, the last thing I'll mention about content and structure. All right. So content and structure, we're praising someone or something. The other second part here is that we have to have some sort of twist beginning in line nine. Right. And uh, we want to make sure finally that we conclude the, uh, the, the sonnet using in the couplet summarizing our, our appraisal of this person. And we want to do all of this using as much figurative language as possible. This is the last thing to think about when you're looking at content and structure, all right, is try not to be as, as literal. Try to be figurative. And you guys have been reviewing some of the different ways that we can introduce figurative language. And these are all good options, right? Similes, metaphors, hyperboles, anomatopoeias, right? These are all examples of different types of alliteration. These are good uses of figurative language that we can use in our poems. So we want to try to use as much figurative language as possible. All right, so structure, content and structure, we're going to have, um, we need to make sure that we have the iambic pentameter, right? And of course, the rhyming scheme. All right, any questions about the sonnet or the, the these structures here that we're talking about what to include in the sonnet? Anybody have any questions? I'm uh, sharing my screen if you're, are... yeah, go ahead. If we are using a uh, figurative language, is it necessary to use it in each line of this sonnet? No, it's not necessary to use it in every single line. All right. Um, this is where I think we can like work together and I can give you some suggestions. If when you're, when you're reading the poem, there's nothing wrong with, in fact, n normally it, the, the poems will go in and out of figurative and literal language. Okay. And, and that's fine. Um, but this is something that's, I can't really tell you, okay, one line should be figurative and then the next line should be literal. And then, well, there's not a formula, right? So this is something that we can work with. I may say, well, try to write, try to use more figurative language 
Yeah, and if 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 I see that there's too much, in fact, I seldom see too much, but I guess it's possible if it just if the meaning doesn't um, make make sense. And this is something else very important. Like when you're using phrasal verbs and and all the other types of figurative language that you can use, try to use examples that you find online, things that you've heard over and over and over that that are common that are used. Uh, because they're they've been around a long time for a reason, and uh, sometimes we try to force, we try to be figurative on our own. We try to use figurative language and create our own figurative language, and I would suggest not not to do that. I would suggest to find those examples, and if it helps, make a list of some of your favorite examples of figurative language. Find, you know, make sure you understand the meanings and then try to fit them into your puzzle. Try to fit them into your sonnet in a way that has, that makes sense. So what I have seen, I haven't seen examples of too, too much figurative language, right? Or too many examples. I haven't seen that, but I, I do see it sometimes where students will try to come up with their own examples of figurative language. And in most cases, it, it just doesn't work because these, these, this creative language has been around, again, for, for a reason. They catch on, somebody says it, and then they're in the discourse. They're in the language and in the culture for, for a long, 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 long time. People say it all the time, and they have specific meanings. And, and again, I think the best thing to do is find those examples online and try to use those instead of making up the ones you, you know, for yourself. But no, you don't have to have necessarily figurative language for every single line, but you need to have, you don't want to be too literal. And, you know, if you have like four, if you have like three or four lines, that's all literal, there's a really good chance that uh, I'm going to suggest that you try to be more, uh, more figurative, that you use more examples, right? You know, for uh, like a whole quatrain that's all literal, probably is not going to be your best option, right? For, for really writing creatively and, and making uh, these, uh, using these examples of figurative language, right? This is why we use metaphors and similes, because sometimes we can't say the same thing as we can metaphorically, right? It really has a it has a lot of meaning, significance, uh, the, the use of these metaphors. And that's why we use them all the time. We're constantly using using them in common everyday speech and and even in some formal situations, right? We we use them all the time. So so yeah, that's how I would address that. Don't and again, don't worry about this is something that I we can work together with. Like again, some of my feedback will be in that sense. Like, should you use more or less? Or does this metaphor or does this example of figurative language, does this make sense? Is this the meaning that you're are you know that you want to articulate? All right. Any other questions? If you guys are looking at my screen, I am scrolling down just under activities. I'm in week 15. And just below activities, we have a wiki. So this is where I would like for us to develop our sonnet. We'll continue much like we did in the first three poems, developing our sonnet in this wiki. So make sure that you're developing it. Again, doesn't matter. You don't have to have the completed version. If you're just working on one or two lines, then just work on those those lines in your wiki, preferably, so that I can see your progress. And if you have questions, of course, then we can look at those. Um, but basically, I want to give you guys the rest of today to begin developing your sonnet. And uh, as soon as you have one line, one or two lines, I'd like to look at them to see to check for iambic pentameter, making sure you have 10 syllables, da -da 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 and thinking about the rhyme 
You know, choose easy words, please choose easy words. Don't make it more difficult than it needs to be. A lot of it's going to depend on the word that you use at the end of each line. Choose, I would choose very short words. No more, I probably wouldn't choose words more than two syllables. Okay, one or two syllables. And if they're all one syllable, that's great too. But choose words that have, um, you know, that, that are easy to rhyme with. You know, a lot of people want to rhyme with, uh, end with uh, the word like love, right? That, that's a very common, common theme that we want to include. And I encourage you to include that if you want to. But not necessarily ending the line with love because there's a lot of there's not a lot of words that rhyme with love. There's love and there's dove, um, above. I mean, th there's not a lot, right? And if everybody's going to be using love and dove, yeah. So, so maybe you use the word love throughout or whatever, or you're you're expressing this emotion of love, but you know, it's uh, be careful with the words that you end with in each of the lines. Make it easier for yourself. I suggest making lists, all right? Making a list. For, write out cat. Now, how many words can you find that rhyme with cat? All right? And write them all out. As silly as they sound, write them all out. All right? And then find another word. Um, sit. Like how many words can you find that rhyme with sit? And if it helps you, you can check out the, the website. I think we talked about the rhyming website. Let's forget the actual name of it, but rhyme zone. Okay. So it's not a perfect website, but it will give you some ideas. If you're not sure, of course, consult a dictionary, but sit, Brit, mitt, Hit, knit, and there's, you know, quit, split, right? Again, and some of these words are just going to be, you know, they're not going to make sense. They're not going to be frivolous. They're not going to be something that you would even need to consider. But when you're writing your list, write them all, write everything. Yeah. And be careful with two syllable words like armpit. We could, we can never use armpit, right? That's a word you can never end your sign it in because it's two syllables and it's weak, strong. And we need, and we need, I'm sorry, it's strong, weak armpit. It's strong, weak, and we need weak, strong. So it's okay to use two syllable words as long as they're weak, strong. Da -da. Okay. So try to keep that, try to keep that in mind. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic. You guys jump in. If you have questions, you want me to look at something, you have any questions about anything that we've talked about in terms of what to do with the sonnet, if you're not sure how to start, you want some suggestions about how to start, um, just jump in with your, with your doubts. All right, guys, we're getting ready to conclude today's class. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to make some some progress today in your sonnet. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go through some of the steps that um, that I follow. I'm going to create a sonnet as well. And if you're looking at my screen, just to explain my process. Now this doesn't mean you have to do the same thing, but you need to try to find some system, some strategy that works to bring these ideas together. What I did is I started by creating a list. And when I began developing this list, I had no idea what I was going to write about. Uh, no idea on a topic, although I'm asking you guys to think of some something to to focus on at first. The way that I began, I didn't have anything in mind. So I started off by labeling at the top A through G because I knew that I need to find words that rhyme in each of these letter designations, right, for our sonnet. So under A, I have words that rhyme with cat, B, words that rhyme with sit, and so on, right, all the way across. And these are all different. 
and I created a list. Some of them I came up with, others I checked online in this website. And I didn't use all the words, but I found some words that that I liked that that I thought might work. And I created all my list, right? So at this point still, I had no idea what I wanted to focus on. So then I started looking across this table and I thought about the C for my topic. I looked at different words and I started highlighting certain words that stood out for me, right? That maybe I could write something about the C and use some of these words somehow, right? And end with these each line with these words. Now, I notice on some of these, I highlighted more than two. I basically only need two words for, from each of these lists. But in some cases, I've actually put in bold more than two, thinking, well, maybe depending on when I'm working on the line, I may choose one word over the other. All right, but again, this just gives me an idea. I actually went back to which list was it? When I was developing this list and I highlighted the words, I noticed that I needed more words. I think it was the first column, if I'm not mistaken. I actually went back because I didn't have any words from this first list. I got down, I think I had this list down to that. I was like, well, I don't have any words that it fit. I, I put in bold the rest and I thought, okay, I like these words. But the, there was nothing that stood out here. So I went back to this list and looked for more words. And then I came up with chat and spat, right? Now, I can still change as I need to, but I felt, well, now maybe these two words I could make work. All right? And I was also thinking about, especially in lines, or these, this, this word here, cake, this is going to be my, my volta or my twist or my turn. So this is going to be also where I need to change some sort of idea. So I'm kind of thinking about what I want to say, how I want to praise the C using these words. Then I started creating a list of figurative language options, and I'm still working on this. But I, I, I am looking. I, I know my topic now. I know my object of my sonnet. I know some of the words. I did kind of a word association here. Based on that, I'm coming up with some mm, examples of figurative language that I might use. I, I may not use them, but I feel like these, some of these could fit in a poem about the sea. All right, so I'm going to continue tomorrow with this, with this list of options. Okay, I have not begun yet a, a line. If you guys want to start right in and writing a line, that's fine also. All right, just try to find a, a strategy that's working for you to, to make progress in developing and thinking about how you want to put all these ideas together. Right, Writing a sonnet, like most uh, poems, it's, it's like a puzzle. You have to put piece it all together. And you know, when I'm looking at these figurative languages, I'm also thinking about iambic pentameter. Right? And so... That's also another consideration, whether I put maybe a, a word before some of these, you know, but th this is something else I'm trying to think about at the same time, looking at examples of figurative language, thinking about how it might fit into iambic pentameter, because later we're, I'm going to try to put this into a line. All right, so this is just one example. I'm going to continue as you guys are continuing, and... Um, if tomorrow you have some lines that you have or, or just I want to hear maybe your progress, how you're approaching the sonnet, and uh, I'll give you guys time tomorrow in class again to develop the, the, the sonnet. I would like to have our first quatrain uh, completed by, by Monday. All right, hopefully it's before then, but if not, uh, I would like for you to try to finish the first quatrain by, by Monday so that you can get some feedback early on when you're developing the rest of your quadrants. Okay, so that'll be our next assignment, finishing one quadrant, four lines, and you can decide if it's the first quadrant or later decide if it's a, you know, it doesn't matter which, but again, I want, I'd like to see 
one quad train early on by by Monday, if not before, so that I can give you some feedback and you can use that feedback when you continue the rest of your quad trains. All right. Any questions, guys, about the sign in? No teacher. No teacher. All right, guys. Well, then we'll stop there for today. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you guys tomorrow morning. Take care. Thank you, teacher. You too. Thank you, teacher. See you tomorrow. Thank you, teacher. Bye.